My opening gambit is that too much of what passes as academic critical thinking is really an automatic form of habit. Let me just offer a few examples. One current mantra is that all of our knowledge is mediated. Well, of course. However, this framing does not address why showing that our knowledge is mediated is at this current historical moment a gold standard of intellectual work. Furthermore, this mediatedness is ultimately meaningless because if everything is mediated, then mediation has no intellectual work to do. That is to say, showing mediatedness is perhaps the blandest form of critique. The rise of mediation has come at the expense of objectivity, or what Kant called judgment, but this has encouraged mere relativism. Kant defined judgment as the finding of the universal in the particular, and in giving up the possibility of universality, we have given up on knowledge outside of particularity and mediation. No age has been more in need of the possibility of universality. Unfortunately, our main form of universality is mediation. Mantra two, a close cousin of mantra one. Everything is both socially and historically contingent. Again, of course. Philosopher of science Bruno Latour has argued that the social has become so overused that one does not know what it means anymore. Even worse, critics talking about the social, in his view, have lost sight that the fact, uh, lost sight of the fact that pointing out the thinking Pointing to the thinking as social is to change it. The point of doing things that are social is to change things. I find it somewhat amusing that in the name of the social, we have too often indulged in patent conformity. Less amusing, perhaps, is the way in which our obsession with the social allows us to think that we have converted academic thought into social action. Finally, philosopher of science Ian Hacking notes that at 30,000 feet, nobody worries about the social construction of gravity. A third mantra, there is no outside to materiality or physicalism. Here, I worry that the reason why it looks like there is no outside is that within materiality or physicalism is one of our most abstract thoughts. I recall here Hume's warning that there's no such thing as substance because substance is necessarily a concept. Within quantum physics, I wonder if entanglement functions to suggest a causal relationship between two things without having to specify the guts of the connectedness because that guts cannot be measured. Nor can one even specify which event came first. Entanglement is what causality, without the need to specify temporal prior priority, looks like, and hence the rise of the term entanglement within the humanities. Within neuroscience, sometimes this declaration of physicalism does not prevent recourse to mentalism, which means that at the moment physicalism allegedly prevents dualism, it installs another one. Other times, this declaration of physicalism is satisfied by a promissory note for some neural mechanism which our technology cannot identify now, but will specify in the future. Our current name for this is the connectome. Philosopher Ned Block decries our reliance on high-resolution neural mapping, arguing instead that we need better psycho-neural concepts to understand how the mind is implemented in the brain. More generally, philosopher of science Thomas Kuhn made our habits more palatable by calling them paradigms, and he tried to think about how revolutions in thought occurred. Our obsession with physicalism is predicated on what we think the physical can do and abstractions can't, which is to say, hovering, it, hovering within it are ideas and abstractions that physicalism sometimes pretends either does not exist or is trivial. Let me press the point. Too often, academic critical thinking is simply banality. Humanists have become so comfortable with critique that it is almost a knee-jerk move to look at incipient forms of classism, sexism, racism, nationalism, and homophobia. But for whom is this critique really news? Humans are guilty of bad behavior. They always have been. Critique, moreover, is the easy part. Putting something else in its place is the hard work. Within neuroscience, the habit might be that cognition is limited to the brain. But with the help of philosopher Alva Noe, one can ask what would happen if cognition were instead an interaction between the brain and its environment. Noe argues that mind is life that mind is all about the manner of living with one's environment. With the help of cognitive archeologist, Lambros Malaforis, one can further ask, 
how things are necessary to thought and what might an archaeology of cognition tell us about cognition. Together, these thinkers suggest that Cartesianism has become one of our worst habits, and even when we deny it, we return to tools for thinking about cognition as if the surrounding environment did not matter. I love how the nascent discipline of cognitive archaeology demands thinking about how one can find traces of the history of cognition in material objects. The very discipline lacks an inside of the head position from which to work to think about cognition, and that is, I think, a real potential virtue. Harvard professor of psychology, Ellen Langer, worries about how much learning is mindless. She places the blame in part on the idea that students must learn the basics so well that they become part of second nature. What she means is that habit becomes the ultimate form of learned ideas. She further defines mindlessness as an entrapment in old categories by automatic behavior that precludes attending to new signals and by action that operates from a single perspective. Again, habit is to be blamed for mindlessness. Thinking about how critical thinking devolves into mindless habits perhaps helps us to consider why critical thinking is simultaneously much valued but so poorly defined. The rubric for critical thinking developed by the American Association of Colleges and Universities, for instance, begins at the moment of the specification of a problem, but this is to ignore how one identifies a productive problem in the first place. There is the repeated emphasis upon synthesis, but this is to avoid the problem of thinking about how one differentiates a strong synthesis from a weak one, not to mention the limits of synthesis. Particles and waves do not synthesize. More to the point, reducing critical thinking to one potential form of it, synthesis, predicts the outcome of knowledge in advance, and prediction without a scientific test makes for poor knowledge. AACU further claims that critical thinking is imaginative, but I'd like to see how that improves the rubric for measuring it. One example I use with my students is I talk about peanut butter underwear, which is something I hope no one in this room has ever thought about. It's imaginative, but how useful is it? It needs to be said that not all forms of imagination are equally useful. Another problem, to what extent do disciplines or theoretical positions define critical thinking in such ways as to reify habits of thought that have become so inside it is nearly impossible to explain them to the outside? Instead of careful explanations then, we have habits and behaviors that we call synthesis or imagination. Think here of how a laboratory scientist could not possibly explain every step of her procedure, but relies on habits like objectivity. Moreover, habits within disciplines become ways of our having conversations with each other. Without these kinds of shorthand, would the conversations themselves be possible? Neuroscience supports the equivalence of critical thinking and habit. Now that I've invoked neuroscience, you have to believe me. Studies have shown that the very presence of a picture of a brain raises credibility. Current neuroscience links automaticity and consciousness because consciousness is, is expensive in terms of resources. Philosopher of science Andy Clark describes how human beings self-assemble complex skills, and they do so through, quote, a complex chain of nested habit systems. In this view, thinking becomes habitual so that we can manage cognitive load. Consciousness and cognition, unfortunately, take up a lot of calories and storage space, sometimes not enough calories. Hence, I have to run. If so-called experts show a decrease in brain activation in doing the very activities one, in, one is expert in, habit would seem to enable expertise, not thwart it. At the same time, expertise as habit allows it to become mindless. In linking critical thought to habit, then, my larger challenge is to have us question why we become attached to only certain forms of intellectual work as intellectual work. Why does a historian think that thinking historically is the be all and end all? Why does a laboratory scientist think that the only intellectual work that matters belongs to the lab? Why do literary critics think it's always about language? Within our thinking about cognitive load, I wonder if we're too attached to emphasizing cognition as a closed economy. Is cognition a set and fixed quantity, a finite resource? Isn't the point of thought to, bev to better leverage those resources? Must we be cognitive Malthusians? In arguing that food supply could only grow arithmetically while population grows geometrically, 
Malthus both refused to entertain contraception because it was immoral and could not anticipate the chemist, Humphrey Davies, development of fertilizers. What equivalent entities is cognitive neuroscience blind to because of habit? I have thus far argued that critical thinking has devolved into habit. We rightly resist this equivalence because we want to think about thinking as spontaneous and not in terms of, auto of the automatic and involuntary. But not all habits are bad, and habits do not have to be automatic. Think of the work that must go into making a new habit a habit. How then to leverage habit to avoid the absence of thought in the name of thought, while at the same time to enhance expertise and mobilize its capacities. I now take back the word devolve and turn to suggest that we embrace the idea of critical thinking as habit so long as we can find a way to allow the benefits to outweigh the dangers. Here's what we gain from embracing the term habit for critical thinking. It will remind us that sometimes we need to question our expertise and to consider the ways in which we are blinded by it. It will further allow us to think about the need to teach our students the habits that count as expertise, both how to convey the inexplicit within expertise, and in so doing, make explicit what habit is all about. What are the stakes of our disciplinary habits? Moreover, teaching and learning thereby become defined as the inculcation of the right habits. Teaching and learning thus are transformed into forms of doing, social practices, and not just ideas in the head. Teaching and learning thereby also become less abstract and more behaviors, behaviors that can be assessed and managed. Students learn that the only way to master knowledge is to practice it, to do it, and wrong-headed notions of genius and innate talent and creativity become transformed into the act of doing something often enough. One becomes a writer by writing. I am claiming linking habit and critical thinking helps shift teaching and learning from the movement of ideas that operate inside the head to the transfer of behaviors, forms of doing. A model of this kind of thing is Gerald Graff and Kathy Birkenstein's They Say, I Say, which shows students the common writing moves academic writers make. Director of Duke's writing program, Joseph Harris, argues that students need to be taught that all writing is rewriting the work of others. And the trick is to figure out how writers forward the ideas of others, come to terms with those ideas, and counter them. Writing as rewriting thus does away with the idea that I can simply quote and run. What am I using the quotation to do? Further, these acts become social acts instead of private individual accomplishments, and thus collaboration becomes central to the mission of learning, even as all writing becomes entering into a conversation. If one of the obligations of a university is to get its students to value lifetime learning, learning as habit reminds us that it is never done. I want to return now to the issue of automaticity of habits and reconsider why we do not want critical thinking to be automatic when parts of thinking may indeed be automatic. Recall the theory that expertise reduces cognitive load. One trend in cognitive studies is to think about cognition as forms of information processing, but also to think in terms of cognitive systems. So for example, some popular metaphors for thinking about cognition are termite mounds or beehives. Individuals in these colonies do not do their own work, but taken as a whole, the colony functions much like a cognitive system. All this is to say that certain forms of thinking may in fact be automatic and part of a system. Our brains, moreover, lack a central control. To put it another way, what is the difference between thinking and an algorithm? I did not have much respect for algorithms until I read that the human circulatory system has capillaries that, mu that must reach every single cell in the body. How might such a thing be designed? It turns out that the designer might be an algorithm. Or think of great tennis players or piano players who work automatically. The worst thing you can do is to ask a tennis player how he makes that forehand shot. Neuroscientists have been interested in zombies of late precisely because consciousness may only be a limited form of awareness. My point here is that it is not possible to avoid all forms of automaticity within thinking, and perhaps it is time to get rid of our allergy to automaticity as a form of consciousness. How then to embrace habit and yet avoid the problems I have diagnosed above? We need to inculcate the habit of questioning our attachment to particular habits, else all we are doing is making our students into zombies. We need to use habit against habit, 
The resistance will allow us both to evaluate the intellectual work of habit and to remind us that the role of education is to make the best habits of thought into deliberate choices. We all know we can change our habits, but we also all know how difficult it is. If we embrace teaching as the inculcation of the right habits, we can set the goal of instilling the habit of thinking about what passes as critical thinking um, too often merely reproduces the status quo. I want students always to consider what counts as thought in this thought and why. Of course, that means, at a minimum, helping students see that cut and paste and the juxtaposition of two points are not yet forms of critical thinking. I am reminded here of the romantic hatred of associationalism. But they need to ask, what is gained by having made this particular connection? There is more. Teaching them that critical thought is a habit allows it to become a shareable social practice that takes place at the moment of doing. We hear today the skill employers most want is the ability to be a great learner. By framing learning as a behavior, but one that is subject to change depending upon the circumstances, students will learn to have habits, but not to get overly attached to them. They will learn to pick the right habits for the right problem and change them for different circumstances. They will also learn that learning is a form of doing and that it requires collaboration because it is a social practice not something which occurs privately inside one's own head. And the idea of learning and thinking as taking place in one's own head is perhaps the first of many habits I would recommend that we rethink. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, is this on? Yes, okay, thank you. And I want to pick up on the point of critical thinking as a doing and how we would actually do that, what that would look like in the classroom. What kinds of writing assignments, what kinds of activities, how to structure a learning environment so that critical thought can be conceptualized more as a creative and performative act. My background is an IR theorist. I teach classes in IR theory. I teach world politics, which is an introduction to the theories of IR. I teach a gateway class on identity, race, gender, and culture. I taught classes on ethics and international relations. All of the classes that I teach are theoretically based. And the question is, how do you take a room full of students and expose them to this deep, critical, theoretical work and get them to really engage it, own it, and learn how to do it and how to make them excited about actually doing it. And so my comments today will, uh, what I'm going to do is to discuss my conceptualization of critical thought and then I want to draw on Foucault and his ideas of self-making and his idea of care of the self, and then to weave that with Butler's, Judith Butler's work on performativity. And then at the end, I'll lay out some of the different ways in which I have tried to actually bring this theoretical conceptualization of critical thought to actuality in the classroom. And for me, classes and teaching are always about thinking along a developmental spectrum. So that even within the semester, you think of where you're starting with your students and where you want them to be at the end of the semester. So how can I structure readings and activities and group work in class that will have that developmental feel to it? The other aspect of teaching for me is that in many ways teaching, uh, Richard mentioned tennis, I'm a big, I've played tennis since I was in high school and played in college, still play. Um, and for me, it is about the repetition of making a certain shot and knowing every time you go for it, it's there and you can do it. And so learning in many times is this circular process where students have to be able to come back again to the same types of assignments in slightly reconfigured ways so that as they're learning, they can practice anew, they can put into practice the things that they are learning. So all the essay assignments that I give are in effect circular. They just kind of change their shape and become a little more complex with each assignment. And then that leaves me open for the midterm and the final project 
to circle back on the work of that half of the semester and to provide students with a new opportunity to then utilize the theories in a new and different way so that they're still working with the same material but in slightly different iterations. Hence, I draw on Judith Butler and the iterative idea of performativity. So let's talk a little bit about critical thought. Everybody talks about it. I'm not quite sure we all know what it is. So for me, in the way I conceptualize it, it is a highly political act. Critical thought is at its base, I think, subversive. And it is meant to be an activity that raises pointed questions, that makes people uncomfortable, that pushes back against boundaries, that questions borders, why we've demarcated Y from Z. So critical thinking is a highly political, a highly charged activity. It draws together agency. So if you think about agency in terms of us being steeped in regimes of power and knowledge, yet we still have a capacity to creatively engage these regimes of power and knowledge, and we can instigate change in these regimes of power and knowledge. So critical thought draws together agency, and it also draws together autonomy, the ability to reflect on your social context, to interrogate your own identifications, to recognize the limitations in your own identifications, and to actively choose to revise or to retain them. And for me, agency and autonomy are always socially relational constructs. We do them, we carry them out in social settings. Um, also, critical thought also reveals the tension between being socially embedded and our capacity for self-making. It is a subversive political act. It also reveals the disciplinary effects of power but it also lets students conceptualize the productive capacities of power. It opens up moments of contestation. It enables students to recognize how subjects and objects are constituted within historical, <coughs> cultural, and linguistic practices. It helps us learn to identify our limitations, to identify how structures of power operate, and to open spaces for critical engagement. In the final analysis, critical thinking really is the ability for students to interrogate their self and their own social political context. So that's the backdrop against which I conceptualize and organize my class, it are those kinds of observations about critical thought. What I draw from Foucault is this idea of making students aware of their own critical attitudes toward the self, becoming aware of their own traits and encouraging a willingness to rework them. So that means I also have to be open to doing those same things in the classroom, to becoming aware, as Richard said, my own habits, my own limitations, and being willing to open to rework them and to share that actual reworking with students as we're going through different activities in the classroom. And I really talk to them about how we are implicated in the formulation of our own subjectivity and to be able to grapple with the complexity between constraint and possibility. One of the things that I think is most salient in terms of teaching critical thought is to enable students to identify their present, the present formulation of subjectivity and to make determined choices to become the subject that they would ethically prefer to be. So be able to look at themselves honestly and to think about kind of who they are, their identity, and yet to begin to wonder about who might I prefer to be? What might I, what other formulations of subjectivity might I like to consider that I would ethically prefer to be? These types of questions about one's subjectivity and oneself, one's own traits, these really 
are only revealed, and I agree with Foucault here in, in his formulation of talking about actions upon actions. And that's what I'm trying to get at in the classroom, is how you make those actions visible to the students as they're participating in different activities in class. It's really acting actions upon actions that provide the break that enable students to refuse or to question that there's always a unique monological representation and that there are multiple possibilities for life and to think about self-making in this more open framework. So that's what I draw from Foucault. And believe me, I will draw this all together for you in really concrete ways. Um, and this is the way I teach. I always start with theoretical conceptualization so that you can kind of think in a more broader fashion than in just kind of laying out, well, here's an example of what I did in the classroom. Now from Butler, what I find really interesting is this idea of performativity and how to make critical thought an actual engagement in the classroom that students are doing. Um, a previous article that I published on teaching was called Thinking, Doing, and Writing IR Theory. And it was precisely <coughs> about how I make those three processes visible and we actually do the work of critical thought in the classroom. For Butler, what's interesting is to think about one's social performance, what one does, one's acts, and that it has both a coercive aspect to it and it has both an enabling aspect to it. And the idea is to open spaces for repetitious acts and here it would be for the act of critical thinking to be altered or revised in ways that contest or subvert established patterns. We always, as actors, as subjects, we always function as a double agent, if you will. We're always complicit in structures of power. We're always complicit in the way the social context is established and set but we also have the ability to subvert the context in which we find ourselves. So we always have this double agent kind of uh, characteristic. The idea is how do we creatively engage our context and how do we instigate change? And that's what you really want to be able to work on with students in terms of critical thought. There is the sense of an iterative possibility of doing one's subjecthood in a different way, such that it would not merely reconfirm existing discourses of power. Every time a student walks into the classroom, there is this capacity for them to act in a new way, to think a new thought, to challenge you as a professor in a new way, to challenge one another in a new way. And so the idea is as much as they keep engaging in the act, the critical act of critical thinking, how to reveal to them this iterative possibility that every time you do it, it can be slightly different and the outcomes and the results can shift. So how do you make that accessible to them to understand and to see? So for Butler, the bottom line for me is the subject is a permanent possibility. Yes, we get detoured, yes, we get stalled, but it is the capacity of power to rework its own possibility. And that's what I'm trying to reveal and work with on students. So what, at the end of the day, do I want? I want to engage them in the creation of knowledge, to engage them in the work of imagination and creativity. And here I will borrow from Hannah Arendt. And, the, and her concept of action, that one's identity really only can emerge in speaking and acting in public, in grappling with these questions in class, creating this safe space where students can engage, where they can speak, where they can write, where they can think. Because it really is only when you can speak about an issue that you really figure out how it is, what you think about it, and what your position is, and how you're going to respond to other students in the classroom.
And all of this must be done in a cooperative concert with others. And that's, I think, the brilliance of Hannah Arendt, this idea of acting and speaking in public in concert with others, so that we're all vested in this process of learning and critical thought. So what would this actually look like in a classroom? And what are some of the activities that I've done uh, to facilitate uh, these, this conceptualization of critical thinking with a focus on the idea of self-making, care of the self, and this idea of performativity. Well, I will run through a few things I have done from capstone level with senior students all the way down to first year students. And what I will do, first of all, is just give you a short list of them and then I'll go into a couple in greater detail. I once taught a course and I say once, <laughs> um, I had the opportunity to, I was filling in for another professor to teach a course on human rights. At the end of that class, it was all seniors, it was about 24 students. Um, they worked in small groups throughout the semester and they were responsible for different activities throughout the class. The production of a human rights newsletter that came out twice the semester. Um, we had a uh, human rights film festival that the small group was responsible for putting together for class. The final activity in the class was an actual performative art piece based upon their research work that they did in, their, in the course and what human rights issues they were involved in. And as I was explaining to Richard, it is the one time in my career where I told students, okay, I'm not going to film this because I've never done this before, you've never done this before, let's just see how this works. It was absolutely brilliant. When they finished, it was about a 15 minute performance that, they, that the group that was responsible for organizing it organized the rest of the students in such a way that they were working through their research. And then they also, in the middle of it, did this really interesting, evocative um, representation of Gandhi's salt march and actually put a mound of salt in the middle of the room. And some of the groups of the students, and I'm thinking I'm going to get fired, and some of the students knelt on the floor and other students kept walking around them in a circle and their goal was to try to make mounds of salt, some type of productive work. And the students circling around them would keep knocking down their piles of salt. And this, in effect, was their representation of how difficult the work of human rights is. And by the end of this performative art piece, I literally had tears in my eyes and was speechless. I, and going into this project, I must be absolutely, and this is the way I teach, I had no idea what was going to come, but I thought, look, you put 24 really creative, brilliant kids together, give them some project that's outside the realm of the normal, and say to them, what can you do with this? And it really was phenomenal. They actually started the project the same way they ended it. They started in a circle, saying, we are the ones we are waiting for, and then they went through, they all, then there was another piece where they had some verbal interactions. And then at the end of the performative art piece, they came back together in this circle and said, we are here and the time is now. And even now when I tell you, I got chills because it was just a wonderful operation, a wonderful performative moment for them to be able to embody this work of human rights and how difficult it is, but to think about it in, ter in this iterative way of how this can be conceptualized in different ways. Um, so that's kind of representative of the work I do in the classroom. Um, and let me give you a couple of others that might be a little uh, more comfortable for you to try out. Um, one of the things I did when I teach um, global governance is I divide the students, well, I let them divide themselves into teams, and they create global governance newscasts. They go all over the university looking for really cool venues, and they do, you know, some do the Judy Woodruff PBS NewsHour, you know, they can do it any way they want. The idea is they're assigned at specific 
specific target points in the semester where we would be reviewing certain themes and ideas and problems. And the idea is for them to create a newscast that will then be shown in class and will serve as the basis for critical engagement in class. So that it's all the themes we've already covered but they're doing it in this really interesting and new way. They're using visuals, they're using music, they do some interesting things, and then we watch it and discuss it like you would a news segment. And so it has the dual function of content review, but also the possibility for engaging the content in new and different ways in which we didn't already cover it in the class to that point. So that's something that's easily doable. With all of these projects, I always give them a clear rubric of how the project would be graded. What am I looking for? What kinds of things that you should be thinking about in doing the project? Because for a lot of students who really, you know, writing is kind of the end all be all of the critical engagement, these projects can be very scary. And that's not what I want to make them. I really want to make them creative engagements that enable them to work from research and reading and critical engagement in the classroom, but in ways that are creative and novel and new. Um, let me give you an example of one I just did this fall. Um, uh, I was teaching the theory of con social construction and how one how identities get constructed. And lo and behold, we had the Hong Kong protests. Couldn't have asked for a better setup, right? So I divided the students and, and gave everyone readings on, on the Hong Kong protests. I also gave them a couple of news hour segments to watch. I gave them some things from the BBC. I gave them a host of both visual and written uh, information and details about what was going on in Hong Kong. Then when they came into class, I divided them and one group were our constructivist theorists. One group were Hong Kong protesters. One, groups, one group represented uh, the Hong Kong business elites. And one group represented the Chinese government. And the readings that they had been given made very clear that all the actors in this particular situation, this historical context, were all grappling with the question of identity and who they are. And so each this, so what we did in class was I had the constructivist theorists go first, and they described and discussed in class the key aspects of social construction, the key aspects of constructivist theory, the key ideas about identity and the social construction of identity. So their idea, their role was to frame, to provide the theoretical framework. Then we started with the Hong Kong protesters. And they talked about what they were doing, why they were doing it, what they hoped to achieve. And they talked about what, how they were trying to present themselves to the world and how they were trying to act within their social context within Hong Kong so they, they didn't appear to be disruptive or rabble rousers. They were very conscious about how they were playing in the Hong Kong social context. And then the constructivists would interpret and talk about and draw attention to certain things that the Hong Kong protesters just said in class. So what I'm basically doing is I divided the class up so that the theory of constructivism keeps getting continuously run through these different emergent um, kind of uh, um, emergent moments of identity formation. So then, of course, we did it with the Chinese government and their nightmare scenario about Tiananmen Square and how that weighed on them and how are they going to respond and the pressures on the government and the Chinese Communist Party. And then they spoke and talked about what they were grappling with and why and how they viewed the protesters. And then we went back to our constructivist theorists and they did interpretive analysis and pointed out some of the different ways in which they could see constructivism at play in what the Chinese government was doing. And then we ended with, of course, the business, the Hong Kong elites, uh, business elites who wanted this all to just go away because the whole point in Hong Kong is making money and this is really making a mess of things. And so they talked about their sense of identity as the Hong Kong business elites. 
So what followed after this engagement in classroom in the class was a short little debrief about the role of constructivist theory, um, where students felt it was effective, where it wasn't effective, where it came up short, what's problematic about it, what's good about it. Then the essay assignment came, and you guessed it, the essay assignment was for them to be able to write about the role um, of constructivist theory as a way for us to interpret and make sense of the events unfolding in Hong Kong. So in class, we, I actually showed them how you do critical thought. And they participated in those acts of critical thinking. And then they have the opportunity to write. And when you set it up in that way, you would be amazed at the writing you get from students because they have a deep sense of knowledge, they get the theory, they've actually done it, and they've watched other students engaging and doing it. And each time that iterative capacity, each time a group went, the group that followed had a little more depth, a little more insight, and you can see it moving and progressing in the classroom. And the beauty of it is they really are participating in the production and the creation of knowledge. And we do it together as a group. So I think I will stop there. But those are two things that I've done that I think are highly representative and very different. The last one done with first year, first semester students in a world politics class, the last with seniors in a required seminar, a capstone seminar in human rights. So thank you. Shortly after those two, you have <laughs> questions. Or even if it sounds <laughs> a little flaky, I would be happy to, um, to entertain any comments. They figure it out as they go along. Yeah. Um, uh, let me say this. Constructivism comes as the fourth theory in. So we've already, we do the easier ones first. I mean, realism is like falling off a log. You know, they, just, that, they all think that way. So this is the one where you're really kind of breaking out of that, and so by the time, and, and what I have, each, each theoretical paradigm, I spend two weeks on it and do this kind of work in class so that the writing assignment is really their opportunity to do exactly what we've already been doing and to engage. I think this semester, the realism one, um, I had them read a series of different articles and then I had them uh, have different realist theorists advise President Obama on what to do with ISIS. So that was the writing assignment. <laughs> and the, I mean, the responses by Machiavelli were priceless. I mean, they really, you know, yeah, they just, they just get in there and, you know, they really go with it. So, and, and there you can kind of see their creative minds being able to work within the different frameworks of realism, um, but being able to expand upon that in a way that's highly idiosyncratic in many ways. So, yes. I know. Absolutely none. I gave them some examples of performance art and gave them some different things to look at. Um, and I talked to them about performance art and what its intent is. And with a class like Human Rights, we'd been doing this kind of, this is the most depressing class I've ever taught, actually. Um, <laughs> And so the, at the end, at least it was a chance for them to have some positive you know, uh, experience with it. But, but in all honesty, um, I really just gave them a good understanding of what performance art is, what its intent is supposed to be, 
and to be able to work within the projects that the students were producing. And then how to think about how to organize them. And it was interesting, the projects actually broke along the lines of identifying problems that are current problems, identifying uh, human rights success cases, and then looking at um, the kind of broader recommendations one could make in terms of the study of human rights. So they were able to organize the performative art piece drawing on the different ways in which they grouped together the projects. But in all honesty, I gave them very little direction because I wanted it to be as open-ended as possible. And to tell you quite honestly, I really didn't care if it failed because I thought even in the failing, it would be really interesting. Um, and I knew that these were a group of students at Bucknell. That's where I was before I came here. Um, and I just figured, you know, they're really bright. And I think they can do this. And they also volunteered for these groups. So the ones who are more comfortable with more concrete things, like doing a newsletter or the um, uh, film that we did, the film series. Um, so those that already were more creative and were drawn to the project from the get-go, I think we're probably better placed to engage in that. But I had many meetings with them. I didn't tell them what to do, but I told them, think about ways in which you could make the projects visible and that you could use your bodies in terms of representing the ideas and problems that you were grappling with. So that was really the only guidance I gave them. Yes. Yes. And I'd be interested in, in if you had a, uh, a one sentence uh, <laughs> definition of, of your view of what critical thinking is. Um, yes, for me, it is uh, critical thought is. <laughs> Uh, the act of creative engagement. That's, that's it for me. It's, it is creativity. I think that's, that's where creativity is generated from, is in that moment of critical thought. Yeah, and I think. So I would say for me, it's all about um, uh, what, does, what does the idea that you have do? How does it change the way I think about something? Um, and why is that change a good thing? Like, like in over, overcoming X, what have we actually achieved? Um, uh, and so um, to really, I mean, you know, the, the uh, simpler way of saying it is to just ask students to, you know, really reckon with so what. Um, just because you find this interesting doesn't mean it's interesting to anybody else. I'm all open to a claim of why this should be interesting, but you know, students are responsible for making clear why this claim should have interest to others. Yes. So, so the way I think about this is, and this is why I love to teach Foucault and have students think about Foucault, is for me, Foucault is all about the forms of knowledge, the forms that knowledge takes. And what Foucault does, and very few people do it as brilliantly as Foucault has done, um, is he takes a system and he reads it sort of ass backwards, um, uh, but makes it clear that in the in the flipped reading, um, uh, this is the way it usually is, right? So he takes, in the history of sexuality, um, uh, you know, the notion that the Victorians were repressed about sex, right? Um, he turns that on its head to say that, no, actually, the Victorians were obsessed about talking about sex, and there wasn't repression about sex, and sex was all they could talk about, and sex becomes a discourse of identity and of power, right? And so that's the, that's the way in which he flips that uh, thing. So I think that I like to think of uh, critical, the form of critical thinking, right? Not to label, the minute you label something as critical thought, 
you've given it a kind of weight that it hasn't earned. Um, uh, I like to think of it as a form um, which may or may not earn the right to critical thought, um, especially since um, you know, I'm a reader for the ACLS competition, and there are basically seven moves that people make, you know, and it's kind of depressing um, uh, to read people all making the same transnationalism, all making the same gestures, um, uh, when you really want to try to find that project that really sort of thinks outside of the, outside of the box. So um, I think that what he's getting at is, and the other thing that he was getting at is that this notion that we teach our students to resist, right? So I was teaching Edward Said and um, Orientalism, and the student brought up that a book had been published called uh, Ornamentalism, which was a critique of Said for being classist. And of course, Said is classist, right? That's not a meaningful critique um, on some level, because that's not what Said was after. Um, so many people can critique Said, but has anyone, are any of you going to be Said? Right? Who, uh, who is going to be cited? Like, say, who is going to create a field? Um, uh, so part of, so um, part of what I try to do is to try and get students to be less satisfied with that critical cheap shot, um, and really think about, okay, Locke was a sexist, uh, but you know, can you write the essay concerning human understanding? And let me, oh, F O U C A U L T. F O U C A U A. <laughs> okay. Um, let me respond to that too, because I thought that was curious. Um, and I thought about it as his critique of what has come to represent critical thinking, particularly at the secondary level. Um, and I had a struggle this semester with first year students in world politics for the university college. And this is a highly select group. They want to be in this world politics class. They know how challenging it is. They know they're writing once a week for me. Um, and I'm no holds barred nonstop. This is what we're going to do. And they had learned and internalized the DBQ formulation of critical thought, and I used to be, I, w my career began teaching at the elementary, then at the secondary level, and I was a high school principal, and I am very familiar with the AP exam and the DBQs, and they are very comfortable in description, and that for them has become the definition, and that's what they're being taught at the secondary level, is critical thought. The ability to describe with facts three things that fit in your thesis statement. You just shoehorn them in there, and then first paragraph, bang, second, third, and we have a nice intro, conclusion, here's the bow, done. And they are very comfortable describing, identifying, but th yeah, I had a terrible time getting them out to the ledge. Take a chance, make a point, <laughs> say something that's controversial. Plant a flag, make a statement, declare a ground, defend a ground, um, because they, it had just been so ingrained in them that this is the process of critical thinking. This is what critical thinking is. And so in that regard, critical thinking really is the death knell of knowledge. Because if you even think about how the DBQ is set up, right, these short little paragraphs, and they just go through, they circle the information, and then they figure out, okay, what are the three big things, boom, 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 and it's formulaic. And they do it in, in a compressed time frame. Oh, I'm sorry, document-based question. It's the idea of, you know, it, what Richard was talking about. Oh, let's see if they can synthesize and analyze. Here's the, you know, here's the sample documents. Here's the question, you know, and FYI, the teachers who are going to be evaluated on these scores on the AP exams, you're already working with them. Oh, here are sample questions from way back, you know, from X exams, and let's work on this in class. How do you answer this? And it is, that is not critical thinking at all. And so my sense was that's what he was referring to, is what really has kind of been inserted as critical thinking. That is anything but. So 
Yes. I have not, but I've never met a person that didn't know they were being oppressed <laughs> and didn't understand the context in which they're operating um, and the ways in which one might be able to elicit those same kind of Foucauldian driven analyses, but in the context of their own experience and in their own social settings. Um, I would love to speak with you afterwards. I think that it would be a really, I, I would love to talk to you about that. I, well, but I've not a, done that. There was an interesting TED talk about uh, philosophy, uh, teacher teaching within the, uh, the, the prisons. And there was a lot of discussion about how teachers were teaching the students and I think probably the best place to read Discipline and Punish would be <laughs> no, we in it. Yeah. Yeah. Richard? So um, I've taught here for most of my career, and so um, I don't have much practice except as a parent of two teenage boys. Um, uh, and I remember when my oldest son was four, I explained to him what Maslow's hierarchy of needs was. <laughs> And I explained to him that um, uh, food, clothing, and shelter is my parental obligation, and everything else is gravy. So you can choose not to do your summary on pandas for school. That's perfectly fine. You're welcome to choose that. But uh, don't think that that won't come with, without consequences. He's, he's still alive. He's still, uh, he still speaks to me. Uh, his initial draft of that report was stuff about pandas, period. <laughs> Any other questions or comments? Any? So I'm in SIS in 115, and I would encourage you, please drop by if you uh, have any questions or would like to discuss this uh, in any greater detail. It would be great fun for me. Uh, thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you.